We decided to um, undertake this report because of um, to address the lived experience behind hate reporting hate crime, um, as well as obviously the statistics which can speak for themselves because it was important to add the narratives um, of people who had sought the help of Racial Justice Network who had not been um, satisfied or satisfied with the process of reporting hate crimes to the police. Um, when we spoke about this, our director um, Penny had already um, written a report on this that was mostly to do with the statistics. Um, so we worked with that report um, had found and proven that you know only one in ten people who report a hate crime to the police are actually satisfied with how it is dealt with. Um, so we wanted to, yeah, to shine a light on this and um, yeah to highlight it to people. So um, Sharon, if I can ask you, um, what's the trajectory of hate crime reporting? Uh, are we getting more? I mean, obviously the. Any results aren't so good, but are we seeing more or less hate, hate crimes? And, and can you break it down into maybe what types of hate crime are, um, you're seeing most of? I think when we initially looked at um, the report that our, di our director sort of did before and we sort of built on some of that research, what we were finding was that hate crime across the um, spectrum has gone up, so all different forms of hate crime have increased. Um, the only form of hate crime that um, was said to were well, reporting that decreased was disability hate crime. But we also know from the people coming into our communities that a lot of the experiences of hate crime is intersectional. So, you know, people experiencing hate crime aren't just along single narratives or just single axis of just race or gender or disability. These things are sometimes all tied up in one. So, for example, one of um, the contributors also spoke about a participant and someone that they worked with who was an, a migrant from Nigeria but was also had a disability. And when they experienced their hate crime, although it was, the, they, it was racial hate crime they experienced in terms of verbal racial abuse, um, they also felt that the fact that they were disabled also allowed them to be an easy target for that form of hate crime. So we are, especially with, we know that, with the, when we saw the Brexit ref referendum happen, hate crime went up after that. And, you know, everyone spoke about the spike, the spike in hate crime like it was a surprise. And now with, you know, the Brexit sort of finale coming upon us soon, we asked as an organisation, are we again going to witness this spike in hate crime once, you know, that actually goes through? So whilst we are conscious and we are concerned regarding the race motivated hate crime we it's also important that we say that hate crime we've got to look at the interconnectedness and the intersectionality between the hate crimes that people experience and not just try to see it as single forms or single experiences of hate crime could the fact that numbers of crimes being reported going up simply be that people are getting better at reporting crime feel more confident reporting crime or actually there's more places that are more accessible where people can report hate crimes and actually well, that's it interesting point and I you know sort of the tag team either at, at the end of this because when we were doing the report we found out that although the um, a lot of the narrative from the government and CPS and the police will have you believe that the reason hate you know hate crime reporting is going up hence why it's increasing but when we spoke to um, the contributors who contributed to um, our report one thing that they did identify was that um, reporting centers for example in the first narrative that we had and um, places that acted as a reporting centre, or this specific place that acted as a reporting centre, actually decided to stop being a reporting centre because they found that although members of the community were reporting crimes to the police, the police weren't dealing with these crimes. So we argue and we know from the people who spoke with us um, about the report, but even for the people we speak to just as an organisation, we know that actually people are not trusting the police to report hate crimes to anymore. People aren't even trusting reporting centres to report hate crimes there anymore. And then now we know with the hostile environment and this push to maintain the hostile environment, people from migrant communities are extra careful when it comes to, and do not want to report their hate crime at all, because why? It doesn't benefit them. They get no compensation from reporting hate crime. They don't get taken seriously. So a lot of the time it actually causes emotional trauma. So yeah, Eve, I know this is something that we spoke about quite a bit, so I'd like to just yeah get your insight on that too as well. Yeah, it was an interesting thing that came up in our research, because I think it was a little bit of like a um, a red herring that <clears throat> uh, the numbers have increased because uh, it's easier to report but when we 
we spoke to people, um, they didn't they didn't find that that was the case. Um, and we also found that uh, it was only just over half of crimes reported as hate crimes end up being recorded as hate crimes. So although initially people were going in with it as a hate crime, in the final report that was drawn up by the police, the words hate crime weren't found, and it was um, the kind of very racialized um, aspect of the hate of the crime uh, wasn't there. Um, and the importance of it for people, I guess, um, who may who may not know why we're kind of so adamant that it needs to be categorised in the correct ways, because for the compensation for the victim, but also for how the sentence for the perpetrator is um, dealt with and how the judge decides that um, is dependent on if it's categorised as a hate crime or not. So when it's not categorised as a hate crime, the kind of you know retribution won't be adequate for what's actually happened. So um, is the law the law comes down harder if it is that defines a hate crime? Yeah, so it's like um, uh, this was something that I learned through during the report, which is it's always great to keep to keep learning and know about these things. Is um, sentence uplift was a term I hadn't come across before. But this is uh, means that yeah, so um, crimes categorised as hate crime are meant to get a um, more severe, um, more kind of thought out punishment that keeps with this in mind and keeps in mind um, the intention behind the crime as well as the crime itself. Um, I want to ask you about Brexit and. Sharon, you've already mentioned it, and, and this sense that there was a significant rise in, in hate crimes as a result of the referendum. Are you getting the sense that BAME communities are getting nervous now, or migrant communities are getting nervous now because we're, we're reaching the point where we actually really left? Really, really, really. I think that's definitely the sense that we're getting from the communities that we work with and, you know, the spaces that we're in where we're hearing from people that this sort of impending Brexit deadline and are them asking and questioning what does it mean. Um, but um, another thing that we do, um, Race Justice, is we've, we've got this campaign on to stop the scan. And, you know, it's a the device that the police use, essentially making the police border force agents as they're doing home office work. And so all of these things connected, you know, Brexit, the police being border force agents, um, hate crime experienced by the communities, we're really trying to highlight how all of these are connected because people sometimes don't see it as, you know, oh, they're separate issues. But if black and brown communities and, you know, especially migrant communities don't feel like they can trust the police, if they're fearful for what's to come from Brexit, um, you know, how are the police and the government going to be able to know how these communities are dealing with it if they're not if they've not even built that trust up with the community? So we are really arguing when we made the recommendations. Our recommendations are really touching on this point that the police need and and the government need to do better to build trust with those communities, especially knowing that this deadline of Brexit is now looming. But also, they need to proactively um, denounce the hostile environment. You know, we've seen it championed and we've seen it raised. And this, I think it was yesterday morning, the article that came out where the EHRC have found loads of human rights violations and loads of violations because of hostile environment policies. So we say now is the time for the police and the government to denounce those policies and denounce what they're doing, especially since we don't know what, you know, the end of Brexit and, you know, this Brexit finale, what's it going to look like? Um, so finally, the report, obviously well worth reading. So how do, how can people get a hold of the report? Yeah, so the report, um, you can find it on our website, that's racialjusticenetwork.co.uk. It's also on our social media as well, and um, the kind of main points of it are broken down. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon. We wish you, you know, all the best with your ongoing work. Thank you so much, Thank John. You.